Hey, good afternoon to you. If it is, in fact, afternoon where you're at, otherwise, good morning, good day. Will Coleman, how you guys doing? Bill Sylvie here. Good to see you. I'm your happy Harry Hirsute host. On a thirsty Thursday. Hello, Adam Black. Good to see you. We had fun last night. Did, an, did a little... Open mic, open mind, answering some questions, talk some smack, talk some nonsense, played some music. Had a fun Wednesday night in the overall. Missed Kyle. Missed you, buddy. Australia's a mess right now. What are you going to do? But anyway, I'm here. We're here. We're all having a lot of fun. We're all having a good time. So today... I want to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart in AD&D. And a lot of this is going to be about rulings, not rules. Because I sort of kind of take a little bit of exception to something that Gary's got going on in the... Um, In the Dungeon Master's Guide, sorry, I'm just looking in the PDF to to find out where we need to be today. Apologize if I'm a little distracted. So, when I was a kid and I got the Dungeon Master's Guide... One of the things that drew me right in was the treasure tables. Just the idea that somewhere out there, being hoarded by an ancient red dragon, stuffed in barrels and chests and sacks and tucked away in a in a treasury by a group of evil humanoids whatever it is all these treasures out there for players to find that was one of the coolest things in AD&D to me so when I got the dungeon master's guide and I started reading about all of these awesome magic items and treasures, coins and whatnot that you could find just lying about somewhere. I was absolutely just, I was thrilled. I was a bit of a Monty Hall DM as a kid. I wanted players to get the maximum amount of loot possible from monsters be it magic items what have you so So yeah, the first AD&D book that I had, even before the Dungeon Master's Guide, of course, was the Monster Manual. Now, in the back of the Monster Manual, and at the foot of every monster description, you'll see, or not the foot, rather, uh, in the body of every stat block for monsters, you will see treasure type, followed by letters. And then if you look at the back of the Monster Manual, there's a whole chart, a whole table of treasure and what they mean. So if we look at that briefly, I'm going to open that. I'm just trying to get that open. Let's see. 
let's go take a look at that table real quick and I'll bring that up and if you're following along if you have a monster manual and you should if you have a monster manual and you don't know the table I'm very surprised but flip on over to page 105 for the treasure type table which really should have been repeated in the dungeon master's guide but you know whatever so let me bring that up hello Chris good to see you Katie hello Adam Ricky uh, where is it? okay if I open that up there we go all right hey OBS is working as advertised right now all right so let's just take as an example because there's lots of stuff in it um yeah we'll just do treasure type a it's right there at the top it's nice and simple so we've got treasure type a and it's trying to bring in part of treasure type b also dang it all right so look there at treasure type a and I'll explain so under treasure type a if a monster is listed as having, as having treasure type a there's a 25 percent chance it'll have one to six thousand copper pieces a 30 percent chance one to six thousand silver pieces a 35 percent chance one to six thousand electrum <clears throat> excuse me a 40 percent chance of one to ten thousand gold now platinum never gets into the thousands well I mean I suppose it potentially could treasure type G for example is 50 percent chance of 1 to 20 hundred platinum so that's 100 to 2,000 platinum anyway 25 percent chance of platinum under treasure type a uh, from 100 to 400 4 to 40 gems 60 percent chance 3 to 30 pieces of jewelry a 50 percent chance and any three magic items a 30 percent chance that's a pretty solid treasure type that's the treasure type that merchants and bandits and and brigands and buccaneers uh will all potentially have in their lair and then at the other end of the spectrum we've got z we got all the way down to treasure type z which is similarly weighted but note these are percentage types or these are percentages you could roll d100 for a layer of 300 merchants a caravan whatever and come up with bupkis across the board no copper no silver no electrum no gold no platinum no gems no jewelry no magic nothing now if your campaign world includes lesser types of coins or different types of coins you would have to adjust this table accordingly yourself but this is the 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 well for lack of a better term gold standard for AD and D it's right here pardon me guys I'm very scratchy today <clears throat> So looking across the board there, then, you know, there's some pretty healthy treasures that you can get. Now, if you want to know what has it got in its pocket, it says, and you're talking about orcs, goblins, hobgoblins, gnolls, etc., etc., the J through N treasure types cover just coins and just a little bit of each coin j is three to four p three to 24 pieces of copper not thousands of pieces of copper k is three to 18 silver l is two to 12 electrum m is two to eight gold and n is one to six platinum so that's just the pocket change you might encounter with various humanoid creatures walking around they're spending money their pay they're bartering cash although i guess if you're spending money it's not really bartering is it watch as i launch into a two-hour discussion of fiat currency no <laughs> so
So this table, if you go up, and I'll show you guys. Let's just pick a monster. Oh, there's a good one, the sprite. Probably one of the most common treasure types. The sprite is listed, and this is over on page 92, is listed as having treasure type C. So you create some sprites, 16-bit sprites, and you see that in their layer, and that's an important distinction, treasure type refers to money in the creature's layer unless it says in the description individuals jklmn that money is in their lair even if you encounter 300 of a creature and they're not in their lair they're not carrying their treasure around with them unless you the dm want that to be the case understand it's always up to you but generally speaking if they're not in lair they don't have their treasure with them. Oh, hello, picture of Sylph, which might get me kicked off YouTube. I don't know. I think the I think the the automated contextless YouTube uh, thing would have a hard time picking out uh, that rather athletic-looking uh, uh, Sylph's sheer uh, uh, dress and what's underneath it. So. Those are the treasure types that sprites have in layer. So we scroll down, we scroll up, and we look at treasure type C. <clears throat> and across the board, that's a pretty good treasure type. No gold, no platinum. Not a huge chance of having electrum. But it's kind of a middle and treasure type. Now, another note about treasure type. You as the DM, if you create an encounter with monsters and it's in their lair, let's go back to sprites. Let's say, uh, it, I believe it said uh, 30 to 300 or was it 10 to 100? I don't remember. But let's say you roll the absolute minimum. Let's say you roll up 10 sprites. 10 sprites are not going to have the maximum amount of treasure. So if you roll up 10 sprites and then you roll and you're like, oh, yes, they have copper. How much copper do they have? Well, it's 1 to 12,000. Oh, I got a 12. Okay, how much silver? Oh, they have silver. Roll a D6. 6,000. How much electrum? Roll a, a 9 on your 10% chance. Roll a D4. 4,000. How many gems? Oh, they have gems. 6 gems. How many pieces of jewelry? 3 pieces of jewelry. Yes, maps and magic. Um, the lower the number of monsters, the lower you should adjust that. You know, you're not going to it, it, think about it in the old, in terms of the old West. You know, there's a town of like 15 people just on the edge of the Mojave Desert. You're not going to find a Federal Reserve's worth of gold bullion in that town's bank if it even has one. Meanwhile, go a few hundred more miles west and north to San Francisco. And even in the 1800s, there would be more gold than you could conceivably ever spend in modern times. So, you should adjust it accordingly. Now, these treasure amounts given are assumed on the average number of monsters that you encounter in their lair. If you encounter more, for example, 300 sprites, you as the DM should increase the amount of treasure by 50% more, 100% more, but you should definitely increase it because there's an above average amount. These are average amounts of treasure. Now, depending on the creature, the monsters in question are not just going to be sitting on piles of this stuff like Scrooge McDuck, where you can go in, cast sleep, toss them all in a burlap sack, pitch it in the corner, and start shoveling the treasure into bags and boxes to take out. Treasure will be under guard. It might be completely hidden depending on the nature of the monster. 
Um, you know, the Sylph has a Q times 10. And I know off the top of my head, Q is gems. So she has 10 to 40 gems in her lair. On the off chance that you bump into a Sylph in her mountainous lair and she's, you know, your party just decides, well, she's got to go. And you take her treasure. It's not just going to be sitting in a, in a jewelry box on her vanity. All right. She might have had it hidden with an invisibility spell under a boulder that only she can reach by turning into a wisp of air and going through cracks to get to. Treasure should always, always, always be guarded, trapped, or hidden in a monster's lair. To go back to the merchant's Treasure type A for merchants. You think they're just carrying that around? No, they've they probably concentrated most of their guards on the treasure. Or maybe they've got uh, maybe they've got a powerful magic user working for them, and he's put their treasure in a Liaman's chest, and they have a <clears throat> they have kind of a commerce raider thing set up where they've got six or eight guards sitting on a cart as it goes down, you know, a cart with high wooden walls and an enclosed roof and bandits think, aha, that's the, uh, you know, that's, that's what must be the treasure. But inside are more guards and a powerful magic user ready to drop spells and counter ambush any bandits. So this is a starting point, not an ending point, the treasure tables. So take all that into consideration. And all the treasure is not necessarily going to be in one place either. Now, surely some greedy giant king might have everything all shoved off in a treasure closet. But play monsters intelligently. Have the stuff kept. Three to 30 pieces of jewelry... Maybe that's being worn by the monsters. Magic items, that might be used. The only magic item that a group of creatures might have might be a wand with limited charges and a couple of potions. And guess what? Those are in possession of the chieftain who will quaff the potions as necessary and use the wand to defend himself. It's still part of the treasure pile. So when you generate treasure here, to stock in a dungeon. Look at what you've created and think logically about your dungeon design where the treasure would be. It's not all going to be in one place. It's not going to be unguarded. And if it's a useful magic item that it logically makes sense that the creature in question might have, then you should absolutely, absolutely positively consider the monsters as possessing it. Now, there are some items that you might dice up that the creatures in question might not know what it is. I'll tell you a little story. I, re I was reworking the uh, Keep on the Borderlands for AD&D. There are kobolds in the Keep on the Borderlands. And so rather than going with the treasure that was listed, I went with treasure type C, which is what kobolds have. And I rolled it. And lo and behold, they've got some magic items. Any three. I come over to the Dungeon Master's Guide, and we'll examine that in a minute. But I come over to the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I start checking the random magic items table. Long story short... The kobolds are in possession of the Hand of Vecna. If you don't know what the Hand of Vecna is, it is an infamous magic item of D&D lore. It's this mummified hand that if a player has accidentally had their hand severed or deliberately severs their own hand because they're like, hey, Hand of Vecna, 
and they place it on the stump, they get fabulous powers. It slowly turns them evil, and the spirit of Vecna begins to possess them and and turn them turn them into a, a bad guy. But some players seem to want it, so I was like, "What the f hand of Vec? Oh my God! What do I do with that?" Well, the kobolds aren't going to know what it is. It's like, oh, a mummified old human hand. Needless to say, I didn't let that stand, but I just thought it was funny. And that brings us to another point of rulings. If you dice all this up and you get over to maps or magic items, and you say, you know what, it doesn't make sense for kobolds to have the hand of Vecna, just don't don't let yourself be bound by the dice in that case. Now, Kyle might argue with me over that. He might say, you know, oh, I would give them the Hand of Vecna. Well, I wouldn't. <laughs> don't give them the Hand of Vecna. Don't give in to that. <sighs> Hello, IR. Good to see you there, buddy. So you have a very simple system. Let me scroll back up. I'm just going to grab a mon monster at random. Spiders are bad choices because they're kind of all over the place. Shadows. Shadows have treasure type F. 2 to 20 shadows appearing. On average, you're going to roll 11 shadows. If they're in their lair... And by the way... Some monsters have a percentage in layer, and we'll look at this a little bit more closely when we take a look at the monster manual, but this is important for now. When you're creating an encounter, you decide whether or not the monsters are going to be in their lair. A random encounter, especially in the wilderness, can still happen in a monster's lair. It can be near enough that the creature in question will retreat to the lair or you stumbled upon its lair but it's not going to be just a little 10 by 10 room that your party walks right into but um, where was that? Shadow? Shadow so you bump into some shadows then you as the DM decide either by making a fiat decision or using the percentage chance in layer, 40% chance, let's say you roll a 22, well, they're in their layer, and there's 11 of them, you'll just come down. And for shadows, maybe it's a tomb. Maybe they're like the Barrow Whites in the Lord of the Rings. And you come down and you look at F. They don't have any copper. 1 to 20,000 pieces of silver, there's a 10% chance. 1 to 12,000 pieces of electrum, a 15% chance. 40% chance of 1 to 10,000 gold. 1 to 800 platinum, 35% chance. 3 to 30 gems, a 20% chance. 1 to 10 pieces of jewelry, a 10% chance. And then any three except swords or miscellaneous weapons plus one potion and one scroll. Now that's something else. Some of these magic item types in the treasure types will say like any three, 30%. But there, there are many with caveats. Some limit them. Treasure type B, sword, armor, or miscellaneous weapon. That's it. And there's only a 10% chance. And again, treasure type F, any three except swords or miscellaneous weapons, plus one potion and one scroll. So you'll use the treasure type, or you'll use the treasure tables in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which we'll go examine in a minute. But then after you've gone through those, you'll specifically roll for a potion and you'll specifically roll for a scroll. And that, in the simplest possible terms, is how you stock your monsters in their lair up with the treasures. But always, always, always make it difficult, tricksy, and trapped. 
One of my favorite things to do with treasures, and I think you should do this, is just have basically a little utility closet. Now, the monsters have got some convoluted, complicated lift system whereby they dump treasure into this little, say, three foot by three foot space. But the treasure is under a trapdoor in the ceiling. If we're talking about treasure type C, and there's, say, 6,000 copper pieces, 3,000 silver pieces, and 2,000 electrum pieces, that's 11,000 coins or 1,100 pounds of treasure. The characters go into the treasury room. Well, you see some kind of metal door overhead. All right, we'll open it. 1,100 pounds of metal right down on a character's head. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt them a lot. And you just have the methodology by which the monsters put the treasure in and get the treasure out, something that is hidden. If the characters find that, and they realize, hey, it's easier to get it out than to go into that little room and open the door and potentially get crushed, that's fine. But if they're greedy and they pull that bolt and 1,100 pounds of metal drops on them, so be it. But we move on. Now we come to a point of contention in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now I'm going to tell you straight up. I use the methods I just outlined. The Dungeon Master's Guide came after the Monster Manual and after the Player's Handbook. Per TSR, it supersedes any rules. It basically clarifies any rules. But treasure types were always used in 1st edition AD&D. They were used in Monster Manual 2. They were used in Fiend Folio. They were even used in Deities and Demigods. When monsters were given in modules after the release of the Dungeon Master's Guide, when they introduced new monsters in modules, they followed the monster manual format and they used the treasure letter types. If this wasn't supposed to be used, they did a damn poor job of enforcing that. Because if we come over to the Dungeon Master's Guide, we talk about placement of monetary treasure and we are in the Dungeon Master's Guide now over on page 91. Gary, I think, tries here to walk back the Monty Hall um, DMing style. And it starts here in the third paragraph. All monsters would not and should not possess treasure. That's true. A black pudding has no use for gemstones. A yellow mold, very few coins. They don't go much of, of any place to spend it. The treasure types given in the Monster Manual are the optimums that are meant to consider the maximum number of creatures guarding them. Not true. That's not true. Under treasure in the Monster Manual, and if it sounds like I'm getting up Gary's nose about this, I am. If we look under treasure types... Frequency and learn treasure type. We are on page five of the monster manual. Treasure type refers to the table which shows the parameters for various types of valuables in which the monster in question might possess. If the individual treasure is indicated, each individual monster of that type will carry or possibly carry the treasure shown. Otherwise, the treasures are only found in layers of monsters as explained above. Note also that although an er encounter occurs in a monster's layer and the monster possesses treasure, this does not automatically mean that the adventurers will gain the treasure by defeating the monsters. 
Most treasure types show probabilities for various kinds of wealth to occur in the treasure of the monster. If subsequent die rolls indicate that that form of treasure is not in the monster's trove, then it is not there, and quite pos it is quite possible to come up with no wealth, including magical items, of any sort in a monster's lair. Finally, it must be stated that treasure types are based on the occurrence of a mean number of monsters as indicated by the number appearing and adjustments detailed in the explanatory material particular to the monster in question. Adjustment downwards should be made for instances where a few monsters are encountered. Similarly, a minor adjustment upward might be called for if the actual number of monsters encountered is greatly in excess of the mean. <clears throat> And then over here, but of course, Gary says, it's not a contradiction in the rules, but an admonition to the DM to not give away too much. Any treasure possessed by weak, low-level monsters will be trifling compared to what numbers of stronger monsters might guard. So in distributing wealth amongst creatures which inhabit the upper levels of a dungeon slash dungeon-like areas, as well as for petty monsters dwelling in small numbers in the wilderness, assign it accordingly. The bulk of such treasure will be copper pieces and silver. Perhaps there will be a bit of ivory or cunningly crafted item worth a few gold pieces. Now that I agree with. That I agree with. If you come to gold, or you come, well, a, any coins, actually, gold is the standard for AD&D. Items are mostly listed in gold piece in terms of value in the player's handbook. There are a few items, you know, normal travel items, whose value is listed in silver and copper, but weapons, armor horses, etc., all gold. The value of, uh, of items in the treasure lists is given in gold. So it's pretty much the dollar standard in, in uh, AD&D. It's the basic unit of currency, which is a, an acronym Gary revisited for, I think it was uh, Dangerous Journeys. He didn't impose a monetary system on Game Masters for Dangerous Journeys other than to say um, whatever you call it brass pieces, tin buttons bottle caps use the, uh, use the buck B-U-C so if a sword is worth 10 bucks if you're using gold it's 10 gold, if you're using bottle caps it's 10 bottle caps, you get the idea So you might choose to have, rather than the kobolds having, you know, 6,000 silver pieces, maybe they've got it in silks and furs that they stole from a caravan that they managed to overwhelm just by sheer dint of numbers. You know, he mentions um, hidden from view is a silver bracelet with an agate, the whole thing being valued at 20 gold pieces. Well, that's a piece of jewelry, Gary. That's separate. You have jewelry listed already. In more inaccessible regions, there will be stronger monsters, whether due to numbers or individual prowesses and material. These creatures will have more treasure, at least those with any at all. Copper will give way to silver, silver to electrum, electrum to gold. Everyday objects, which can be sold off for a profit, the armor and the weapons and such like, will be replaced by silks, brocades, tapestries, and similar items. Ivory and spices, furs and bronze statues, platinum gems and jewelry will trickle upward from the depth of the dungeon or in from the fastness of the wilderness. But hold, this is not a signal to begin throwing heaps of treasure at players if he, if he were some mad Midas hating what he created by his touch. Always bear in mind that the effect that the 
successful gaining of any treasure or set of treasures will have upon the player characters and campaign as a whole. And then he goes into um, the explanation of a pair of exceedingly large or ferocious ogres, and it talks about their 2,000 gold pieces in wealth. But it's obviously not in a pair of 1,000 GP gems. They've gathered an assortment of goods whose combined value is well in excess of 2,000 gold nobles, the coin of the realm. Rather than stocking a treasure which the victorious players can easily gather and carry to the surface, you maximize the challenge by making it one in which ogres would naturally accrue in the process of their raiding. There are many copper and silver coins in a large locked iron chest. There are pewter vessels worth a fair number of silver pieces. An inlaid wooden coffer worth 100 gold pieces alone holds a finely wrought silver necklace worth an incredible 350 gold pieces. Food and other provisions are scattered about to another hundred or so gold nobles value, and one of the ogres wears a badly tanned fur cape, which will fetch 50 gold pieces nonetheless. There are several good helmets used as drinking cups, a bardiche, and a two-handed sword, with silver wire wrapped around its hilt and a lapis lazuli pommel to make it worth three times its normal value, which complete the treasure. If the adventurers overcome the ogres, they must still or recognize all of the items of value and transport them to the surface. What is left behind will be taken by other residents of the netherworld in no time at all, so the bold victors will have quite a task before them. It did not end with a mere slaying of ogres. So what Gary's saying there is flavor your treasures. Now, I don't agree that if jewelry isn't indicated to make the treasure jewelry, we have a jewelry table, use the jewelry table. But I get what Gary's saying here, but I don't think that we should abandon the treasure tables. I mean, let's go back to copper. All right. Now, kobolds are clever workmen, even though they're weak fighters. Maybe they're copper. Maybe they mined it out of the back of their underground lair. And they're making bowls and drinking vessels and so on out of it. And the rest they have in ingots. I mean, that's a perfectly acceptable way to express treasure. Piles of ingots spools of wires of precious and semi-precious metals so on and etc you don't have to give easily stacked and carryable coins to your players and indeed you shouldn't you should not so consider those things when you're handing out all the treasures Now, with magic items, we come to kind of an interesting point with magic items. Later versions of D&D. And this, the, 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 the creep-in started in a and Well, I mean, it started in D&D, period. Let's, let's just be 100% honest. It started in Dungeons & Dragons. There is no addition that's more or less to blame. I think it accelerated as time went on, but that's just a matter of history. Of course it's going to accelerate as time goes on. Editions have gotten more and more Monty Hall as time has gone on. And so we wind up with what other players of later editions called the Christmas tree effect, where characters are festooned with magic items. Uh, I ran a campaign where the players had a couple of hirelings, not henchmen, not skilled henchmen, hirelings that carried magic weapons and were dressed in magic armor. It, the party was literally like, oh, that's a plus one shield. We don't need it. Give it to the hireling. So, so it can absolutely happen. Let me shrink this down a little. That's better. So Gary goes on. Just as it is important to use forethought and consideration in placing valuable metals and other substances with monsters, thoughtless placement of powerful magic items has been the ruination of many a campaign. I think Gary's speaking from experience, guys. 
Not only does this cheapen what should be a rare what should be rare and precious, it gives player characters undeserved advancement and empowers them to become virtual rulers of all they survey. This is in part fault of this writer, who deeply regrets not taking the time and space in D&D to stress repeatedly the importance of moderation. Powerful magic items were shown, after all, on the tables, and a chance for random discovery of the items was given, so the uninitiated DM cannot be severely faulted for merely following what was set before him or her in the rules. Had the whole been prefaced with an admonition to use care and logic in placement or random discovery of magic items, had the intent, meaning and spirit of the game been more fully explained, much of the giveaway aspect of such campaigns would have been willingly squelched by the DMs. The sad fact is, however, this was not done. So many campaigns are little more than a joke, something that better DMs jape, and ri jape at and ridicule, rightly so on the surface, because the foolishness of player characters the astronomically high levels of experience and no real playing skill. These godlike characters boast and strut about with retinues of ultra-powerful servants and scores of mighty magic items, artifacts, relics adorning them as if they were Christmas trees. There you go. Decked out with tinsel and ornaments. Not only are such Monty Hall games a crashing bore for most participants, they are a headache for DMs as well, for the rules of the game do not provide anything for such play. No reasonable opponents, no rewards, nothing. The creative DM can, of course, develop such a game, which extrapolates from the original to allow such play, but this is a monumental task to accomplish with even passable results, and those attempts I have seen have been uniformly dismal. So what Gary's saying here is essentially don't give the store away to players. Now, I disagree earlier with his admonition about, you know, look, it's just the potential for treasure. Don't have the treasure. You know, it's just, I'm just saying that that's what they could have. No, Gary, if you wanted to change the system, it wouldn't have carried forward in other books. Written by you, I might add, Mr. Gygax. But he sets a very important um, point here that the proliferation of magic items can upset a campaign. Now, I think one particularly powerful magic item in the hands of a low-level party can be hilarious to watch, particularly if they don't know what they have. Or it can be a boon if they are desperately in need of of some kind of reward, some kind of a payoff to help them um, gain levels. Let's consider my favorite AD&D module. Well, one of my favorite AD&D modules, Keep on the Borderlands. In the original Keep on the Borderlands, one of the penultimate creatures that you can battle is a gelatinous cube. Hey, don't laugh, they're dangerous. The gelatinous cube in the original printing of B2 Keep on the Borderlands, in its guts there, sort of floating in the middle of it, has a wand of fireballs. 66 fireball spell. And I think there's six charges on it. Six, 66 charges. That sounds about right. Not going to go diving for it. But I distinctly remember when I was a kid, it was a wand of fireballs. Later, it got downgraded to a wand of enemy detection. I didn't like that. But keep on the Borderlands will keep a party around first through third level through adventuring through it. Now, initially, your players might not understand the Mathematics of Fireball, and it is a wickedly powerful spell. Briefly, and I'll help you out with this if you don't remember our discussion when we talked about spells in the Player's Handbook. A Fireball spell fills 33 10 by 10 by 10 squares. So if your players say, I'm casting a Fireball spell over there, look at the map, and just radiating outward from that, calculate 33 10 by 10 by 10 squares. Now, if the only place it has to go is back towards the party, they're going to eat it. 
and 6d6 is an average of 18 so that may kill a first level party you see where this is funny particularly in the tight confines of b2 keep on the borderlands but it needn't be this christmas tree kind of situation where oh we have the i win button and the next three or four low level adventures you take that party through they're just like fireball 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 first of all it's a limited number of charges it will run out but even setting aside the fact that it will detonate and blow back on them they might consider the treasure value of it and if we scroll down if we look did i go past it no there we are oh the deck of many things So let's look at wands. So the players find this wand of fireballs in a keep on the borderlands. They identify it properly. Rod stabs once, potions, rings, rod stabs one. There's not a specific wand of fireball. There's a wand of fire. And its GP cell value is through the roof. So if you take a third of that, because a wand of fire does more than just cast a fireball. A wand of fire, it does fireball. It does delayed blast fireball. It does a whole lot of stuff. Multiple things. So if we take a wand of fireballs, and say that it's resale value. And note the sale value of wands are all astronomical. Or even if you left it as a wand of enemy detection, its resale value might be 10,000 gold. Now, perhaps in the keep, only the Castellan himself could afford to buy a wand of enemy detection or a wand of fireballs worth. 6,000 to 7,500 gold. But the point is, the players, by the time they find that wand, might be in a point where they're like, well, we have Bob, Jin, Mary, and Sue. They all need to level up. They all need to train to level. And remember, we talked about the cost of training to level. They all need to advance from first to second level or from second to third level. What's the most valuable thing we have? It's the wand of fireballs. Because the DM said it was worth 8,000 or whatever. Or it's the wand of enemy detection. He wimped out and gave us the wand of enemy detection, not the wand of fireballs. Well, that's worth 10,000. So now, all four of those players can level up you know, even if they're going from second to third level, potentially, depending depending on the value that you ultimately decide to give the one. But if they're all going from first to second, that's fifteen hundred apiece, assuming that they played well and they they only need to train for a week. And you'll come away still with four thousand gold left. So consider from a player's perspective, consider that when these super valuable magic items fall in your hands, you don't have to just say, yeah, I'll keep this for a rainy day. I'm playing through Fallout 3. This is my second playthrough of Fallout 3 that I've done. And God, I forgot how much that game crashes on Windows 10. Oh, Lord. Anyway. But in my first playthrough of Fallout 3, I would literally pick every piece of garbage up. Empty milk bottle, burned book, box of matches. I don't, I can't remember box of matches is a thing, but everything, every scrap, I'd be laden down with hundreds of pounds of garbage crawl back into Megaton, 
crawl over to the crater side supply and sell as much of it as possible. And then wait like 30 times in a row for, I forget her name, the NPC that runs Crater Side Supply. Or I'd go to every person in town who could possibly trade and I would trade them all that crap. And then I'd go out and I'd do it again. And I would basically denude the wasteland of everything down to a bent rusty nail. And in no time at all, I had tens of thousands of a bottle caps to spend. But in the same token, I would pick up weapons and pieces of armor and I'd say, hmm, I might need this someday. I'll keep this. And when it became too heavy to carry, I'd go back to my house in the game and I'd dump it in a chest or I'd dump it in a locker. And it got to the point where I'd be carrying around a couple of Gat Gatling laser guns, a few missile launchers, a couple of combat shotguns, scoped 357 Magnum, just on and on and on and on. So I basically just turned into a, a Christmas tree monster. Because, hey, I might need this someday. So as a player, watch out for that. Recognize the value of a magic item isn't necessarily in its use. I mean, rings, you know. You might not think that a ring of mammal control is going to come in that handy. But 5,000 gold pieces sure would help you go from 4th to 5th level. Obviously, a ring of multiple wishes, you know. We'll talk about wishes another day. But from either a player or a DM standpoint, don't be Monty Hall. And if you're a player, don't be a hoarder. Recognize that there's value in the items beyond just saying, I've got it. I've got another plus one ring of protection. Think rather, hey, that's 10,000 gold pieces that I could put into getting a better magic item made or tithe to the church or just make life better for the people around me. <clears throat> but let's have a look. The, this, this is one of my favorite things to peruse. In the time we've got left, let's take a look. So when we come to a treasure... Look, treasure type A, any three magic items. This is the table we check. Potions, scrolls, rings, rod, stabs, wands, miscellaneous magic, E1 through E5, armor and shields, swords, and miscellaneous weapons. So in the case of treasure type A, if we grab our handy dandy percentile dice, if I can find some handy dandy percentile dice, here we go. If we grab our handy dandy percentile dice, three magic items 84. 84 is swords. So we know that the first one is a sword. Second one, 11. Well, that's a potion. And the third one, 27. A scroll. A nice spread of items. Let's start over with potions. What kind of potion? These are the basic potions. If you want to invent potions and expand this list out, then do. Absolutely do. Or substitute things in. So what kind of potion have we got? <laughs> 79. Polymorph self. All right. Well, what kind of scroll? Now, there are many types of scrolls. Some have one spell, two spell, three spells, 
four, five, six, or seven. And then we have protection scrolls. And then finally, we have a curse scroll. 50. That is a six spell scroll. That is a mighty scroll of levels one through six. 30% of all scrolls are clerical. So basically, 71 to double zero, and this is six cleric spells. 55, it's magical. So we come back up, we have six spells of first through six level. Now I'm going to grab six six-sided dice here to make my roll, just to make things simpler. Is that, nope. There we go, that's six. So what are our spells on our magic user scroll? Well, there's a second, two-thirds, two-third level spells, that is. I knocked my die over, but it was a three. A fifth, and two sixth level spells. Now, you would consult the player's handbook, and you could either roll randomly, or you could pick which second, third, fifth, and sixth level spells the scroll might have. Now, you might note over here that there's no XP or gold piece value, resale value, for the scrolls. If we go down a little bit, XP awarded to characters who can use the spells, only to characters who can use the spells, the award should be 100 XP per spell level. So in this case, we have two, that's 200. Plus 300 is 500. Plus another 300 is 800. Plus 500 for the fifth level is 1300. Plus 600, that's 1900, plus another 600. So that's 2500 XP that it's worth. The resale value is three times that. 7,500 XP that scroll is worth, and rightly so. So we'll save the going through that, through which spells might be on the scroll for another time. I think you guys kind of get it. But now let's take a look at the sword. What kind of sword do we have? Swords, here we go. We have everything from your basic plus one sticky pokey all the way out to a plus five holy defender. And over here we have experience points and gold piece sale value. So let's take a look and see what kind of sword we got. 26. Sword plus one plus two versus magic using and enchanted creatures. Now that's a broad definition and you, the dungeon master, should, you know, is a magic using or enchanted creature a a sprite or a, a brownie or a pixie or a sylph, what have you? That's up to you to decide. But there's also a description, so don't, uh, you know, let's see. Let me scroll down. And there might be some guidance given there. Come on. Doo -doo -doo. Hmm. All right, well, we'll have to... We'll have to scroll down a little bit. And we'll get into the descriptions of some of the more outre magic items because they're kind of a lot of fun. But I don't want to just be reading these things over and over and over again. Let's see. Here we go. 
gives its plus one bonus always, plus two when employed against magic users, monsters which can cast spells, so it would cover those creatures that I mentioned, conjured, gated, created, or summoned creatures. Note that the plus two would not operate against a creature magically empowered by some item to cast spells, such as a ring of spell storing, or a scroll, or a wand, etc. And one final note about swords before we wrap up today. If a sword is unusual, it will have an intelligence, an ego, a willpower, an alignment. That's right. If you remember, um, you know, Stormbringer from the Michael Moorcock uh, Elric books and others. Stormbringer is chaotic evil. It's bad. And there is a chance, I believe it is a 25% chance... Let me see. Yeah, here we go. Sword intelligence and capabilities. So we roll percentile dice. So we have our sword plus two, or plus one, plus two versus magic using or enchanted or summoned creatures. And we rolled a 33. So it doesn't have an intelligence, it doesn't have any capabilities, and it can't communicate. It's just a magic sword. But if we'd rolled a 76 or beyond... It would have an intelligence 12, a primary ability, and be able to com communicate through semi-empathy. The possessor will receive some signal, a throb, a tingle, etc. and feel urges when its abilities function. You guys make the jokes yourselves on that one. And then it's got an alignment. Any sword with intelligence will have an alignment. So your players find the sword. It's got an alignment. This particular one, 31 through 55, which is a nice, big, fat curve. It's lawful good. Now you might think, hey, that's cool. My chaotic good character can wield it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That weapon will damage anyone not of its alignment when they draw it. Any character whose alignment does not correspond to that of the sword, except as noted by the asterisk above, will sustain hit points of damage equal to the number of ego points, see hereafter, of the sword each and every time the character touches any portion of the sword unless the sword is in the grasp of or possession of a character whose alignment is compatible with the weapon. So... Yeah, a lawful good sword doesn't automatically do its ego damage to a chaotic evil creature when the lawful good person wielding it stabs him with it. Sorry, guys, you don't get that. But the point of all this is not to go too off and far into the creation of swords as a character. We'll discuss that another day. Treasure is a wonderful thing. Be careful about how you place it. Be doubly careful about how you place magic items. If the monsters have magic items and they're smart enough and they can use them, if it's a wand that's listed as any, let that cobalt chief and break out that wand of magic missiles and start raining hell on the party with it. It's like, oh, pff, we're 6th, 7th level, they're just cobalts. Zap, 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 zap. Suddenly everybody's taken like 4 or 5 magic missiles each. And he's laughing his lizard dog ass off. And when they finally hack him down, well, the wand's all used up. Well, the wand was part of the treasure that they had, so it's burned out now. Can it be recharged? I think a wand of magic missiles can be recharged. I'd have to go and look. But the point is, for that instance, it's used up. So just think about that when you're placing your treasure items, guys. Don't make it too easy. And just catch up on your comments here as we wrap up. 
Ah, Fallout 3. Still have fond memories of stuffing a dumpster full of assault rifles outside the Library of Congress so I could fast travel. Yes. I've done that too. Mental, make a mental note of where you put something and then fast travel. Diablo 1 also lent itself to that kind of uber looting. I had gold piles lying all around Tristram by the time I was done. Yeah. Yeah, there's that too. But anyway, just Keep those things in mind when you're designing your loot and you're filling your dungeon with it. Now, the one exception that I will give is, yes, absolutely, a dragon should have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of coins. Look, I don't care that, you know, a dragon's claws could maybe pick up, you know, 100 coins each and carry it and drop it down. Maybe they hired monsters to bring it there and then ate the monsters. Or maybe dragons know how to use bags. Yes, dragons should have great, huge, heaping piles of treasure. So that's my admonishment to you guys. I want to thank everybody for being here today and being in the chat and so on and etc. It's wonderful to have a great audience like I do. Um, I think right now, let me see. Yep, we're still sitting at a solid 763 subs. Don't forget, we hit 1,000. We have the mini-con. I've talked about it plenty of times. Um, but again, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, Bards of Greyhawk for, for providing the great music. I'll play that track again for you guys tomorrow. I'm still working on a little intro thing. It's not going to be the whole song. It's not going to be like a three-minute opening intro it'd be kind of nice but but i'll use an i'll use a nice portion of it it's portioned out very nicely and it allows me to do that so um thanks to rich and jeremy at bards of greyhawk for making a fantastic piece of music we'll maybe listen to some of that tomorrow when it's friday and we're going to talk about more stuff And I'll see you guys then. And I'll also see you on the Discord, wherever you can uh, get a hold of me. So you guys, uh, you guys have an absolutely wonderful day. I love you all. Please be safe. Please take care of yourselves. And I will see you all tomorrow. Peace. Bye-bye.